Morgan has now finished, it is no more, but there is a silver lining for us. And that is that this session should be like sort of question time on a speed, on a truth drug. There are no spoilers to give away. Everyone here has promised to be utterly honest from the, from the get-go. Um, and we, I promise that we'll have lots of time to ask questions from the floor at the end. But I thought, Philip, looking back at the series, and you were a big star in two of them, and there were slightly less of you in series three, which was your favourite plot line, and which was your favourite series? Um, I should, I should actually... <laughs> Stand up, all right. Yeah. Danes can learn something from the Brits. Um, actually, I think that the, the season I liked the most was the third one. Things came up called family and theatre. So I couldn't be a part of the third season. So when I watched it, I saw actually what the audience saw. A very, very good show with very, very strong scripts and a strong cast. That's actually uh, what makes a good story go around. So that's the season I like the most. And the plot I like the most is um, is the sex thing between Casper and Katina. <laughs>
then, then you're someone if you don't know how to open the <laughs> so, so that was my own favorite personal secret for one. drama for the state broadcaster in a small country with powerful politicians. Um, there must have been a lot of nerves within the production team when you, when you suggest something as potentially controversial as that. Is it difficult? Actually, yes, it was quite difficult because, uh, well, no nerves inside the production, but it was, you know, in a, a day state broadcaster we have a big hierarchy, we have a lot of bosses and uh, the head of drama, he actually thought it was a very interesting idea, but he was, of course, nervous that we would bore the audience. But, you know, the, the media director and all the guys on top, they were, they didn't know if we could do it. But uh, we, so we, for one year, we tried to convince them that it would be a fantastic idea. Um, and in the end, they said, okay, if you give us a lot of private life, at the same time, we can do the political thing. But uh, they were worried that we would uh, offend the politicians, of course, so we had to balance between the left and right all the time. If we had one leftish plot, we had to make a right-wing plot, and uh, Adam, he's been balancing, uh, we have, all the way through. And at one point, we were even censored, you remember that, Adam? Oh, yeah. Almost. Because you know, the f in episode one, when we meet the right-wing politician called Seltum, you know him, Sven O. Yes. When we meet Sven O. The, for the very first time, we see his shoe. And this guy, he has some very ordinary, ugly, ugly shoes. <laughs> uh, and well, that's his character. He wears. Uh, but then the head of drama he said, you have to cut these shoes out, we will do that with the right wing of Denmark. And then the director and Adam and I we said, are you crazy? Are you, are you actually trying to censor us? <laughs> no, we will not cut off these shoes. And then he said, well, well you have to, because he, you know, the head of drama, who's a very He's not head of drama anymore, he's a very nice guy, but he's always being accused of being left-wing terrorist. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, so he said we have to take care, and then um, then we had to put it all the way to the general general director, director general, or whatever you call it, and, uh, and he had to spend Christmas watching, uh, wondering if we should cut off this. <laughs> and in the end he said, don't do it, I think it, it will go well. <laughs> We didn't cut them out, but uh, we had to balance all the way. Now, because Marie, in the third series of Baldwin, you were the glamorous face of the right wing, the Freedom Party, and you wore probably the nicest shoes. <laughs> <laughs> say I really enjoyed the sex things too. <laughs> Actually my real life girlfriend, her husband, that was a nice day at the office. <laughs> no, okay. Well my real life girlfriend, her husband is uh, Thomas who played the, I don't know, he's okay. early. Yeah. yeah. So I had to call her and say I'm going to meet with your husband today, it's going to be a really nice day. <laughs> I was going to ask about the third series, because the third series almost never happened. You didn't expect it to happen. So having planned the first two series for four years, the, the third series you put together in, how, how, how did you get the idea for it? Why was it so different? Well, I think uh, it's a, um, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. I think it's, it says a lot about uh, DR, uh, the Danish broadcasting company, that they they don't just automatically press the button if you've done something that they liked. They don't necessarily just say, give us another season. They say, give us a reason to commission another season. 
Uh, so, uh, so we had to give them a reason, and um, and there has been kind of an, an, an epic story in modern Danish politics, uh, which is the story of a, of a new party that emerged. We have a multi-party system, but we could do with even another party, and uh, and that has been a, a very a great story, a, a great triumph, and a terrible fall of that new party. And I just thought that that was. That, that's real life politics, and I just thought that story would be excellent. Um, and also, I thought after we told the story about uh, well democracy from the, the point of view of the, of, the, of the prime minister's office, I thought we should go to the nucleus of democracy, where actually you have an opinion, you try to sell it to people, you gather some people, uh, and you rally around a new party uh, flag, and then you uh, you aim for war. So Borgen as the, the, the building of the parliament in, in Copenhagen would be kind of the goal of the third season, whereas it was the, more the setting of the third season. Mm -hmm. So we just thought that was a nice idea. Cesar, oh. of course, the, th the third se season was big changes for you because you left the second series as a prime minister. And then the first time we see you in the third series, you're, you're flying around Hong Kong on a helicopter. Um, you're wearing fantastic clothes. The wardrobe really, really sort of steps, steps up a notch in series three. Um, for the first two series, you've said previously that you, you looked at Tony Blair. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's a bit overrated. I just, I just said that I was inspired by his, um, his uh, uh, metamorphose, his uh, changing of physics that I, that I just followed because uh, my research for, for the character... I'm not excusing myself. I, I commit to that I have seen Tony Blair become more um, a defined silhouette throughout his years. And, um, and uh, I, I found that uh, with my research, uh, I really had to go far, farther and farther away from what I was watching to be able to use it for anything. Because if you get too close to any politicians, it's <clears throat> it's so not concrete, and uh, it becomes a matter of views and a matter of this and that that I could not put use as an actress and a character. I had to go for this, take her seriously, and make her outstanding, unique, and uh, everything. So. The only thing that really inspired me with Tony Blair was that after a while, he became, to me, he became that that character that he was playing in such a very precise and defined way that you could see him from miles away and you could see, oh, there's Tony Blair and he's like that. So that's what I tried to do myself. <laughs> in the end of season two, whereas in season three, I go, <laughs> And I wear really nice clothes. And I think, uh, <laughs> I think it was also, I mean, I think, I think it was, to me, it was really, really interesting to have been on top. I mean, you can't get further up than being the prime minister in this world anyway. So what happens if you're not that anymore? I thought that is such an interesting story. Um, and you could either, you know, start from, going way underground and trying to dig yourself up, or you can be somewhere else. And I thought it was interesting that, that uh, Adam said she's out flying. She's on top of the world in, in, in fancy new clothes. And it was such a, um, but, but, but it, whereas I really enjoyed in, in the first season, I, I love my office, as, as I said, but that's also because it was so character defining to walk through that office, to sit by that desk I became the Prime Minister and, it, and I played with the desk even more than I played with my fellow actors. Or, or they gave me even more, you know, feeling of character. <laughs> and, uh, no, Pilou as well, I played with him. <laughs> he, he made me feel like an actual woman. <laughs> but, I, uh, but, but that whole, I mean, that, that, that sort of energy or thing that, that sort of bounced off those of the set and, and the costume and the being tight and being a minister and the bun and all that, to, to, to give all that away 
uh, and just sit whoa, in a helicopter and having no concrete feedback was also terribly, terribly scary. <laughs> Can I, say, can I say one thing? Absolutely. Did you feel like a desk? <laughs> How Cesar felt with her desk, I felt it with my uh, suit. Yeah. And actually, it's, 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 uh, this is not funny. It's actually a, a thing that we talked about with Sean Carl Jacobson, who was the director of the two first episodes. Is that Casper, you would wear a suit for 20 episodes, and the day we would take the jacket off, or we would untie the button, that would be the day Casper, you started to break up. And if you watch it again, you can actually see that we start in some episodes to loosen up a little bit, open the buttons a little bit, because he's on the wrong path. But it is the right path for him, but the wrong path as a professional spin doctor. And so in the third series, but frankly, you're, you're not in a suit very often. I'm just having casual sex. <laughs> so so it makes your hair fall out sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> Statement about the hair. Pidou made me do the hair. <laughs> because Pidou was going to play a very important character in Denmark, uh, a famous billionaire called Simon Spies. Yeah. And, uh, and he was going to be bald for that uh, particular part. And uh, <laughs> we still wanted him in Borgen. I'm sorry. So, so yeah. one day I was, I was actually called by, by Camilla, called me at 10 o'clock at night, Sunday and said, just, just for your information, Hilu is going to be bald <laughs> Wednesday. And there's nothing you can do about it. <laughs> and, and we just had to find out how we could possibly make him bald. So that little plot line that some of you that saw that particular episode with the child, and he falls asleep because he's so tired and working so much, and the child, that was the best idea. <laughs> It's not the worst thing I did. I broke my knee in episode 19. <laughs> well, that, that certainly kept the scriptwriters on there. Tell us about your, your knee and the battle of the broken knee. There's one thing you're not allowed to when you write a contract with the uh, it's play sports. And uh, we've done like 17 episodes and I hadn't played sports for like one and a half year and all my friends were going out to play one night. What's gonna happen? <laughs> And I hadn't played for three years, and I did the first move like Michael Laudrup, or I think I did, and my knee just... And I had to call, I didn't want to call Camila because I knew she would be freaked out. So I called the line producer and said, oh, I fucked up. And we had to rewrite the episodes, the beginning. And actually, the, the, the thing that Cesar, as Bikita Newport tells, Casper Yule as a spring doctor, why the fuck did you play football as a spin doctor with the other spin doctors? That's what Camila told me that morning. Why the fuck did you as an actor play football with other actors? In boxer shoes? Are you fucking retarded? I'm sorry, pardon my English, I'm not there. So that's the truth. And then, Camilla, you, you rewrote the script and the, the, no, I... invented a scene for it. Yes, I offered Adam to write the line for for Birgit Newport because I can write. I was so furious <laughs> because we had it. We had, we were so busy. It was the end of season two, wasn't it? Yeah. And we were so tired. And now we just wanted to get this job done. And then he breaks his knee. And oh my God, I could have killed him. <laughs> so I uh, I asked Adam if I should write the script. Actually, just that particular scene. <laughs> Actually, sorry, just a quick, quick detail. The, the ni episode 19 and 20 is about wealth, uh, wealth uh, care, welfare. What is the word? Wealth care. Health care. Yeah. <laughs> As I said before, my English is. Yeah. Uh, Health care. And people came up to me when they got out in Denmark and said, "That's a nice twist that he's got his knee broken." <laughs> Cesar, if we can take you back to offices, because in the third series you really come alive when you leave the trappings of wealth and international corporations behind. And there you are, 
in a basement, turning a basement, which is not dissimilar to this, <laughs> into the hub of a new political party. And you, you almost see the energy come back into you at that stage. Um, how, how was that, and how, did you, how, int how difficult was it to sort of take your, your character off onto another new path, the pursuit of power again? Uh, it, it, I, uh, yeah, it was difficult. I hated that office so much. Um, even more so because it was actually the old office that they changed. So they taken down all my lovely um, wallpaper and beautiful stuff and turned it into shit. <laughs> and then people in with them. There, oh, you know, it was, I had to share it. <laughs> so many opinionated people with airtime and things to say. And, oh God. So I, I really, really struggled in that office, and I don't think I ever really came to terms with it. The, the, the good thing was that. Uh, in that office, there's a, a tiny room where they have their meetings just to have some privacy, which is even smaller than it looks on screen. It was, it was like one square meter. It was claustrophobic and horrible, and the lab was the ugliest light you can imagine. So <clears throat> that, that gave a lot of motivation. <laughs> Because uh, the third series is full of many, many different themes. And again, I, I'm always interested when reality and the politics sort of collide. Because um, you did prostitution, you did communist past. But what was the most controversial episode that, that turned out? Pigs. Well, yeah, for me personally, it was the pigs. Definitely. <laughs> what, uh, tell, tell us about don't, what happened. Don't mess with the Danish pig producers. <laughs> Actually, I think they, they had kind of a, a, a press readiness uh, for when, when it was aired in the UK. Because what would happen to the export of Danish bacon? What if you all of a sudden abandoned Danish bacon because of Danish drama? What, what, a, what an absolutely crazy thing to do. But they were actually worried about it. So I was, uh, I was uh, beaten pretty badly up in the press. But it was nice. I mean, you get kind of used to it. <laughs> so, uh, and after, uh, after that, prostitution. The funny thing with the prostitution uh, episode was that actually the Conservative Party in Denmark made a proposition in Parliament, in the real Parliament, that was identical to the proposition made by the Gide uh, And that's when we knew that it was time to leave this show. <laughs> <laughs> that's just getting too close. <laughs> well, it was interesting, very interesting. So, Camilla, did you spend a lot of time sort of smoothing down political worries? Were po politicians always sort of trying to ca catch your eye and tell you that they uh, wanted... No, to... I only spent time trying to convince the boss or try to pre prepare him for what Adam and the writers were about to do next. So, uh, no, actually, I did not have anything. I was just busy doing the series, actually. Yeah. Because it's quite, again, it's quite controversial. You, one of the big themes of series three was about television, and about how the state broadcaster is always under the pressure of being made more commercial. I mean, I, lo I love the, I love the storyline about how um, you, they wanted to turn the political debate on the night of the election into a game show. <laughs> Was there a message there? Uh, yes, but that something like that actually happened uh, on the um, co on the competitive channel to DR, the, the TV2, Danish TV2. They actually, not in this election, the, our last election campaign, they, 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 they did, um, they did a, a political debate like a, a handball uh, a match. Exactly like, with referees and whistles and, uh, and uh, no, we'll send you into the wings and uh, we'll bring in the reserve and, and it was completely outrageous. Uh, and I think you can actually find clips of it on, on YouTube. Uh, that was bringing political debate to a new kind of commercialized, crazy level where it just didn't make sense. And we wanted to put that in the show, obviously. <laughs> Now, Cisa, you, as both stats minister and obviously as yourself, you're known as a woman of impeccable judgment. 
But in Britain, there was a lot of controversy because, and maybe this is the great divide between Denmark and, and, and here, Jeremy, why Jeremy? <laughs> to talk more about sex. <laughs> left, left that chapter. Um, so, so what is your question? Why Jeremy? In, in Britain, people absolutely adored Philippe, your first husband. <laughs> the, rugged, no, the rugged Nordic. But the effete did, 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 you not, did you not see what he did to me? <laughs> we made a contract. And within 18 months, he had to sleep around because he felt really lonely. Yeah, so you think that's, that's fine? No, I... Uh... <clears throat> yeah, I, I, I still don't understand the question. Why, Jeremy? Oh yeah, you were not, you're not too hot. The, the Danish woman really, really, really liked. <laughs> around when he was on set you could you could you knew he was on there before you and so on because there was a lot of flushed <laughs> really going around oh he's really charming we have a thing for for english gentlemen with a thing <laughs> i think that's that's just our wet dream i suppose <laughs> and you lived up to that i have to say well he was very sick that was sick. <laughs> Just, yeah, just just to add one thing. Uh, now we, we really discussed it a lot in the storyline room um, because we thought, after having been prime minister, who is she going to date from Denmark? Uh. It will be so incredibly difficult because everybody will see the prime minister and uh, and the power and everything. So, and then we kind of made that new career for her. That now she is kind of international chairman of boards and uh, and it would be very. Uh, if she was very likely to meet somebody, somebody outside Denmark, and uh, we just uh, happened to meet uh, a lovely British actor that uh, that sees it like that. <laughs> so, uh, so that was actually that was the choice, and also one very important plot that to put them together again, the wonderful rugged Danish. Um, uh, uh, Michael Birke, uh, who played uh, the husband, that would be wrong plot-wise because in the plot, in our little uh, world of Borgen, he is perhaps the love of her life, and uh, she's lost him. He has abandoned her, and she has lost him, and you cannot get that back because there need to be a price for that life, and uh, if you get it back, then it doesn't make sense. The whole plot. Uh, it would be pat, it would be too easy, it would be just sweet, and we didn't want to do that, even though we were constantly kind of, please do that, please do that. <laughs> and in a sense, the politics came full circle as well. The politics, sorry. The politics came full circle as well, because we, we started with a, a conservative prime minister, Exactly. And we ended with exactly, and also, I mean, also the the the, the sacrifices she makes. Uh, they needed to be bigger and bigger, more and more painful. So in the first season, she loses her marriage and the close uh, relations with her, her family, her kids. Also, in the second season, she almost uh, she has to ch choose between the mental sanity of her child and her career. And in the third season, it needed to be her life that was on stake. Therefore, the, the cancer story. And, and to tell you one, one beautiful thing about uh, what a wonderful actress she is and how much she defends uh, and holds on to her, her role. When, when I first talked to Caesar about the cancer, it was it is like the, the relationship between an actor and, uh, and, the, and the writer is sometimes like a doctor-patient or something. And then I said, we consider giving you cancer. And, and, and Caesar said, Thank you. <laughs> that's that's a great actress. <laughs> Why did you say thank you? What did you do next? <laughs> To say to Catherine. <laughs> no, but then my husband, we think we talked about, can we kill Philip? <laughs> In a 
tragic camping accident. Oh, the grief. Oh, it's terrible. Sometimes it's really terrible. Or one of this, another child. No, there's some really, really perverted uh, conversations going on in that writing room that people shouldn't know about at all. Um, I think. Um, no, but, so, did you mean something with that question? Yes, the cancer. <laughs> No, but that, 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 that uh, as, as Adam said, that it, it got, the, the, the sacrifice has come closer and closer to herself. The, the fact, um, yeah, that she's, she's going to lose herself and what? No, it's just very, very interesting. Very, very, a completely new perspective and something that... Um, uh, it was nice that she was so completely unable to deal with it compared to what she's been, you know, she can, I can deal with anything, I can be in the desert and I will survive and I'm da 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 da, but when it's here, I thought, uh, uh, yeah, it was just on so many levels very interesting. I can just hear one thing, just uh, the, uh, the, the scene where, where Begida, where Sisa tells her children that she is in fact very ill uh, and that she has gone through treatment. Now, of course, I mean, we've been through that scene thousands of times, but I think actually that when Camilla and I saw it in the, in the editing, we actually both cried. Um, and that is, uh, that's the traits of a great actress. So, yeah. Peter. Like, like the second, between the second and the third season, I have to leave now <laughs> because I have to go with an airplane. I just wanted to say what a brilliant experience, what a wonderful, wonderful trip and what is so wonderful with you British people is you have the greatest taste in the world. <laughs> Thank you very much. to um, take our life in our hands, or possibly our microphones, and throw the questions open to people from the floor. Now. I'll come to you. Hello. Um, I was going to ask a two-part question, one to the creators, which is, for all our Nordic noir, noir fans, it's some disappointment or interest when your shows get adapted in the States or America. And I suppose part of the, the great thing about this particular show is it would be a, a bitch to adapt. Or have you been approached by people to at least buy the format to, um, to, tran you know, to transpose? Yes. Um, actually, it's the BBC Worldwide that takes care of the, the, the remake rights. Uh, and currently, the, the HBO uh, claims that they want to do it. But we don't know. I mean. Americans and uh, Los Angeles is it's the hot air city, so <laughs> so I, I I don't know, but they seem to be very keen on doing it, um, and it, uh, of course it will be really difficult to adapt. Uh, but I think one of the the, the 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 ideas is to bring it to state level at least in the first season, because then you then you actually have a multi-party system. Uh, also in, in the U.S., I mean you can actually meet a social democrat in New York. <laughs> <laughs> He's probably Danish, no? <laughs> no but anyway, yes, so, so that's, that's kind of, that's the plan anyway. But we, we don't know. It, it might be and it might not be. But we keep our fingers crossed. What, what um, three things would Cissé take to a desert island? <laughs> it's, a, it's a very English question. We have a show oh. called Desert Island Discs. Well, you usually have to take eight, eight songs, one book, and one luxury. I, 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 I'm terrible with those questions. Uh, I had to, to choose my favorite film, and I narrowed it down to 89. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, I can't do that. I'll take Adam. Yeah, you can cook. A cup of coffee and my phone. That's <laughs> Does Adam's relationship with his own mother <laughs> carry through into the emotional heart of Porgen? 
can I lie down? Saved by the bell. <laughs> uh, that's a very personal question. Um, obviously, yes, I've had a very professional mother. So I have also, uh, who was uh, head of drama for the Danish National Theatre uh, in her later years. Um, so yes, uh, definitely, I think all children with very, very busy parents have experienced uh, the sacrifices. Uh, and seen, well, the, the, the nice face of, uh, of the big career, but also the ugly face of it. Uh, and I've tried to put both into the series. So yes, definitely. We'll try a technological shortcut now, and I've got some questions which um, people have sent me on Twitter. So, um, this is from Nicola this is from Charlene Legg, and it is, um, what do we have to say or do to persuade you to make season four? Can I just say that today I think we should do a season four in ten years. I think so. I think so. Because I, I still think that, um, I, I, I still think that the former uh, a Prime Minister, someone who's been there and gone a completely different way is so interesting and I think we don't we haven't explored that. Yeah. And I'll be yeah. out of ten years on. I'm in, I'm in. Ten years we'll do it. And and a question for Marie, which is just what was people's reaction to seeing you as such a glamorous right-winger <laughs> amongst the ordinary people of Denmark? Did it make you popular or not? <laughs> well, I had um, some friends' parents who didn't like their children to meet with me because they thought I was a really bad person. <laughs> These, uh, these characters I play that are not really nice people. But the funny thing is that we actually were quite, uh, what did you say, uh, prohibited? Can you say that? We wanted to make this character look very nice so that you would, uh, you would actually think that she liked children and little dogs, but she did. <laughs> so that was kind of the twist with her. We wanted people to feel comfort and be, you know, in a good company with her, but you won't. You won't. <laughs> okay. um, and the, I'm just trying to think what, where we are about to. Um, Danish interiors. How much of a relief was it that in series three you finally didn't have your bedroom next to the kitchen? <laughs> No, 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 in, 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 in my new flat where the kid lives, her, her bedroom is next to the kitchen. It's just another wall. Yeah. And there, there, there isn't open doors. It's so interesting to, I mean, when, when we did, I'm just talking a little bit now, because when we did it, of course, we were thinking very much of making a series for the Danes about Denmark, about our history. And it's a, it's a public television, so we, we had the whole, the whole of Denmark in front of us. So I've, I've never, I've never thought so Danish before. And then uh, the series travel, and we sit here, and, and I've been here before, and I've talked about Denmark and all that, and, and, and it's been fantastic to see your country from afar, and and uh, <clears throat> to love Denmark so much as I do when I'm here, because it's like, like when I hear you talk about your country and your politicians and your TV series and blah, and we, we, we always, always hit on ourselves in that way, and we're critical, we don't believe this and that, and you know. But when it's another country, you can just, you can, you sort of just buy the whole thing. You, 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 you believe in it in another way. And that sort of, um, the thing I like about Bogen is that it is, it is optimistic, it's, there's something hopeful in it. And, um, and I think that's really, um, 
That's how I feel when I'm here, when, when we talk about Denmark uh, here. I, I, I really like my country, so thank you very much. <laughs> Just a quick comment, because we've actually heard that many times, that many British people are kind of curious about having bedroom next to the kitchen. But with the prices of real estate in London, you must have your bedrooms in your kitchen. <laughs> I mean, in, in, in Britain, one of the sort of charms of the show was that it showed a woman getting to the top, but it didn't obsess about the fact that she was a woman. So that was thrilling to people here. I just wondered what different takes did you get as you went around the world? How was the Austra did the Australians pick up on something different in the show? Did the French pick up on something different on the show? Because you, you must have seen all these different reactions. Well, uh, I, I think that, that Denmark is probably a bit uh, ahead, a bit more progressive when it comes to the, the complete equality of the sexes, and I don't know if we, if we have that. But I personally, uh, I think uh, in, in France, to some of the, of the audience in France, uh, I am a, a great fellow feminist. <laughs> 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 uh, and, uh, and, uh, and Caesar is the leader of the pack. No, but it, and, and whenever we've had some, because uh, we, we talked a lot about the, the scripts, uh, uh, my privileged, uh, um, and, and Adam, Adam started by saying it's a feminist project, and um, sometimes I had to ask, him, are we still being feminist? Because now I'm thinking, uh, and yes, it is. And uh, I think the, the, the most feminist thing about it is to that, that, that whole, that it's a woman, being the Prime Minister, is taken for granted. We have to say it's just the way it is. And, and to Denmark, that was at that point pushing it a little bit because it was not for granted. When we got our first female Prime Minister, it was a big deal. But we, we sort of played down in Bogen to have that that's not what it's about. And, and particularly France, but when I've been talking to French journalists and women in general, they, they, they say it, it couldn't happen in France. I mean, how could she not, how, how could the papers not write about what she's wearing every day? And, and you know, bring up the fact that she's a woman, every single article will be about that in France. I think that's, that's and then they, they really liked it for, for that fact. And still, when you see some of the most famous press photos of our current Prime Minister, Hilda Tomic Schmidt, they, they focus a lot on her expensive bags. And I mean, and if a, if a male Prime Minister had an expensive bag, nobody would care. <laughs> um, and a, qu a, a question which is coming for, for half done, which is, when you wrote the theme music for Borgen, did you start with the... <laughs> or did the tuk 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 come later? <laughs> well, <laughs> well, that's a very good question. No, I, I, I don't think I did. Actually, what I, what I wanted to achieve with that theme was this roller coaster uh, travel between happiness, um, tightness, um, unhappiness, all, the, all these emotions that you go through in the series. Which was, uh, it became some of a sport for me to, to see how many things I could squeeze in, in one theme, uh, um, <laughs> 40 seconds long. So, uh, but it was quite interesting. I, th I think it went surprisingly well. Uh, you know, the, the thing about changing emotions for every second uh, measure, it's, it's kind of crazy, isn't it? That's yeah, the music that stays with you for a long time. <laughs> And of course, the inevitable question, which is um, the selfie. What would Beer Geet have done at Nelson Mandela's funeral? I think, th I think this one's for you, Adam. <laughs> um, she would have asked Obama to take a picture of her. <laughs> I was interested that the 
feel-good factor was very strong, but whether SISA actually um, has been approached by any political parties. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, has has CISA been approached by any political parties? I, um, I'm afraid I cannot answer that question. <laughs> Wait until the next election in Denmark. <laughs> you can't parry that one that easily, surely. So you have been asked. <laughs> have to wait for 10 years of politics to pass by before you come and do it fictionally at the end. Um, yes, I think that's good. It would be a very popular addition to the European elections, I think, they're coming up in May. <laughs> would Sissy like to run in the UK next time? <laughs> Um, I was wondering if you, um, since you would consider treading the boards in the West End, because of course, uh, Katrine, uh, the, the uh, actress who plays Katrine, um, we went to see Coralina sat for the Donmar, so we were lucky enough to see her, and she was terrific as Virginia. So I was wondering if you would actually perhaps see yourself on the, on the stage at the National Theatre. So I know Sophie Grabo is doing that as well this summer. I'd love to, yes. <laughs> And Marie, are there any Definitely. casting scouts? Uh, can you not say from West Wing on, if you inspired a lot of people doing politics in the more uh, noble career than they have done, do you think that Corbyn inspired people or young people to be more interested in politics, or do they think it's more political? In America, uh, the West Wing inspired a generation of young people. Do you think Borgen has inspired a generation of young people to think about as a noble career? Well, actually, they, they did a survey because we have been accused from the very beginning, actually, half a year before we aired the first uh, program, we were accused by the extreme right of being very leftish and that we would now kind of uh, force people into voting for the red parties of Denmark. Um, so they did a survey, actually, the Copenhagen Business School did a survey on, on, the, on the typical organ uh, viewer and um, and the great thing for us is that uh, they could answer a clear no to if, they had, if their political views had changed, but a clear yes to that they had become more interested in politics as such. And that, would, that was the greatest thing for us. We were very, very grateful for that answer. Okay, yeah. Series two and series three, so much had happened. Was it difficult to conjure yourself into a third series? Why did you Why did you make so many of the storylines have moved on such a lot? Uh, well, because definitely we, we wanted to tell the story of the new party, and we wanted to drag her out of politics and make it real difficult for her to come back. I mean, she has to leave that very pleasurable life with helicopters and very fancy clothes and a handsome Englishman. No, the handsome Englishman, he, he remains. But still, uh, she has to make some sacrifices there also. Uh, so we needed a kind of a time frame uh, to show in a completely different world uh, and in order to surprise us as much as possible. Also, I, I personally really liked the the, the, the 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 evil in the in the first scene between Casper and uh, and Katrine, where they're together with their child, and it looks as if they're a happy couple, and all of a sudden he gets up and says, "Well, I'll see you on Thursday." And leaves. Uh, I thought that was really mean. <laughs> I, 
I, I just wanted to thank everybody here for bearing with us with all the microphone problems. Um, but most of all, I wanted to thank you know, the most astonishing five people who really are the brains and body and beauty of Borgen. And they've all been here today and they've answered the questions with tremendous honesty. Uh, and no wonder they have fans across the globe. Would you please put your hands together?